Hi, my name is Mary O'Day, and I am the SNAP leader in Phoenix, Arizona. Fairly new and fresh to the movement. Love it. Same as Tim, saves my life. And it's an honor and a privilege to be able to help other survivors. And it's an incredible honor, and I'm going to get emotional, but I always do. <laughs> when I'm talking to people who work so hard, for us, to help us move forward in what we're doing, to fight for us, to make awareness. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker tonight, Marcy Hamilton. She's a mainstay in the movement to bring justice and healing to survivors. She's the founder, CEO, and academic director of Child USA and the Fox Professor of Practice at the University of Pennsylvania. She's not only a renowned expert on legal issues like statute of limitations, she's also an outspoken and public advocate for survivors. She's the author of numerous works, including Justice Denied, What America Must Do to Protect Its Children. Please welcome Professor Marcy Hamilton. I love technology. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, in many ways, it's like seeing the face of Barbara Blaine again and again and again. I miss Barbara. Uh, she was a force of life, uh, but you are her living legacy. So thank you for uh, asking me to be a part of that. So it's not an understatement or an overstatement, it's just a fact. Uh, 2019 has been a banner year for statute of limitations reform. Yeah. Child USA has been blessed uh, by a very generous donation from the family of Sean McElmail. Sean essentially gave his life having been a victim and then victimized again by drug addiction because of the abuse. And the McElmails are the salt of the earth and I'd like them to stand up and so I can thank them. They're worth the standing ovation. So because of them, Child USA now has a legal staff, including a staff attorney solely dedicated to statute of limitations issues. And we update SOL information every week on our website. So if you want to know what's happening, uh, first of all, I'm going to show you everything I got. But then after that, you can go to childusa.org. And it is the generosity of the McElmail family that makes it possible for us to do what we're doing. So who does not know what an SOL is? Total success. Just one person raised their hand. Uh, so uh, 10 years ago, I'm on Anderson Cooper and uh, talking about Penn State, and essentially, uh, I say statute of limitations and blank stares. Now, you say statute of limitations, well, that's, that's, you don't need to say that, you just say SOL reform. The movement has gotten on wheels, uh, and that's because of people like you who have come forward and made it possible for the world to understand that we've got to change the system. Uh, in order to help the victims and to prevent abuse. So the best science that we have, which is what's most persuasive for lawmakers, tells us 
Uh, it's a study out of Germany. It's the most comprehensive study with the most uh, survivors involved. Half of those involved were clergy sex abuse victims, but the average age of coming forward is 52. A third never, never come forward, a third during childhood. So what that tells you is that if justice is not going to, yeah. is that good? I'm loud enough by myself. <laughs> I could have told you. Um, so if the average age is 52, that means the vast majority of states were shutting everybody out, uh, uh, especially states like New York, where you had until age 21 to sue an institution until uh, they changed the law recently. So, you know, why you all are experts on why victims don't come forward. I don't need to tell you why victims struggle to come forward because you're all living your own reality. But the world needs to understand. It's not that you don't want to, and it's not that you're being difficult. It's the actual trauma and the way that the science of trauma operates makes it very, very difficult to come forward. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that every victim experiences this individually. It's not a class action opportunity. Each individual is given a different response by where they are in their lives and what's been done to them. So, you know, 2002 is the year that I mark in terms of changes for justice, because that's the year we knew that priests were abusing children, right? Gote was in the 80s. I mean, this wasn't, there were one-off stories all over the country, but it was in 2002 that we learned that powerful men were covering it up. That is what changed the discourse. That's what changed the way in which we could talk about this issue. So I very naively, um, I wrote Justice Denied in 2008, uh, and it was written for lawmakers. The table of contents is basically written for lawmakers because they don't read. And it just says, here's the problem, here's how you solve it, and just go do it. So my theory, I was at Princeton, my theory was I would write the book, explain to everybody that the statute of limitations were much too short for child sex abuse victims. Everybody would agree. And then I could go back to being a fancy constitutional law scholar. That was the plan. That was the explicit plan. Uh, and that's how I sold it to Cambridge University Press. Um, but then the book came out and then first things uh, and the lawyer for the bishops nationally went after me in an article called Marcy World. Game on. Enough of the fancy crap. Back to the reality. So you all are part of a movement out of the largest institution in the world. Did you know that? Largest religion in the world. Largest institution. The Catholic Church is enormous. That's why there are so many victims. But it was providential that the Catholic Church would lead the wave on this, that you all would lead the wave on child sex abuse because it turned out it was a problem in all religious institutions. Look at the Southern Baptists this year, in schools, in universities, medical professions, uh, right now, the, 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 the rolling arc of scandals right now is focused on doctors. Doctors with children alone in their, in their examination rooms. Sports, of course, the Boy Scouts, Hollywood, government, armed forces, camps. It's everywhere, as you know. Um, but we were given a gift in some way. can do in the past, which we must.
first of all, it takes forever. If anybody goes into a state for the first year a bill is introduced, it's not going to pass. It's just not going to. Now, no, you know, the rest of the country doesn't need to wait 16 years like we did in New York. But still, good causes take time. The civil rights movement wasn't built in a night. So it takes time, but it also takes an army, right? I think half of this room is in this picture. Um, and this is New Jersey, only, only took 14 years in Jersey. We were on a fast track. Um, but what this, this is advocates, survivors from a variety of contexts. This is SNAP leaders. This is the heart and soul of our country banding together for children. And New Jersey passed an innovative window. They passed a two-year window to open on December 1st, which applies to children who were sexually abused, but it also applies to people who were raped as adults. So that's a new model. That's a new model. And that basically happened because we didn't tell anybody what it was going to do. Uh, so basically, if you break it all down, this is how the, um, the bills broke down. Um, but notice that on the revivals that we even have a large number of revivals this year. I mean, the revivals have been the hardest, whether it's a window or an age uh, revival. That has really been um, difficult. So one of the things that we started doing about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe two years now, is ranking the states. Because no matter what would happen is you'd go into a state and they'd say, well, how are we? Right? And, you know, I uniformly would say, you're terrible. Um, oh, well, we can't be as bad as, you know, Alabama. That was always the answer. Um, I'd be like, well, you could. Uh, and for a while, New York, Michigan, Alabama, and Mississippi all were holding the record for the worst statute of limitations in, in the country. Um, but at this point on criminal, Alabama is now one of the best, um, which is hard to believe. Um, but what this shows you is that on the criminal side, we've made such tremendous progress that the vast majority of the states are at this end, right? Look, see, number three, just a, a three ranking, five is the best, three is mediocre. There's my home state of Pennsylvania, which um, at one point they thought they were so progressive because they were going to put the criminal statute of limitations at age 50. Over the course of 10 years, they've become one of the worst. So the states that aren't taking action are falling behind. And the states that are taking action are moving up to the front of the line. Uh, the civil ranking here, uh, Delaware, Minnesota, Vermont, uh, really the best, but uh, I told you about New Jersey. Vermont is the most innovative of the year. Vermont has eliminated the civil statute of limitations backwards and forwards and erased it. There is no limit. It's, it's not a window because windows close. It's just open. Now, if more than five people lived in Vermont, I'd go retire, but yeah, what, what am I going to say? Um, so, and, you know, to this day, Little Delaware had the standard because not only did they pass a, a two year window and eliminate civil and criminal going forward. They even passed a second window when they understood that their window wasn't fully being applied to the medical professionals. So to their credit, that was pretty remarkable. But Vermont may have an idea here, right? Because in Delaware, we've just learned about another abuser from the past and well, the window closed. So my view is we fight for the windows, we get what we can, and then we go back. Eventually, we'll all be, we won't live in Vermont, but we'll be like Vermont, which is good. My daughter goes to school in Vermont. I know a lot about Vermont. Uh, so 
the real question is, is why do these revival bills matter? And they matter because there's two sets of victims in the country, and there, there's a huge divide between them. There are the victims that were shut out. So the past, right? The ones that are frozen in an iceberg of no justice. And then the kids right now who are being abused, who are getting the benefit of these forward-looking extensions that have become easier and easier to get. You have to do something about the frozen iceberg. You have to get that information out because if you don't, you're going to miss some of the people that are harming your children. So what we have to explain to lawmakers is why does it do you any good to help an older victim? Right? I mean, they're all, they'll say, well, you know, of course I want to protect a kid today and kids are in school. I'm going to protect the ones I know are in school and need help. But the answer is, is that it's the older victims that can even identify a still operating perpetrator because they operate into their elderly years, like John Gagan in Boston. And we still need to um, understand that these are the nice guys. And so if you think the fabulous and nice, and I know that there are female perpetrators, there are, but the vast majority are male. So what we need to do is to sell to lawmakers, to society, to the media, to social media, that this is a problem if you don't help the victims from the past. They have to be our priority. They have to be the priority. And that's why the revival legislation is so important. So here is a timeline of SOL revivals. And it, what you'll see is that you start over at that end and you have, you know, list of names, et cetera. And then you have a lot of activity um, toward this end. And we have ended up with now we're going to have seven states that are opening up a, some type of revival window in their state during 2019. That means a waterfall of information for the public that's going to come out uh, in this year. Um, many of you are familiar with this. You know, the, the, we're always told that we can't have these revival lawsuits because they're going to be so many cases, what will we do? And if one more reporter calls me and says, you know, the New York courts are going to go out of business with all the New York cases opening up on August 14th. Um, and the answer is not so far. But, you know, if 50,000 victims come forward in New York, okay, I'm fine. Um, that's fine by me. That's not going to hurt anybody. Um, so, when you rank the statute of limitations revivals, Vermont wins backwards and forwards. Um, but Delaware, Hawaii, and New Jersey aren't bad with Hawaii having a two year window, which then they thought, well, let's do another two years. And then they just recently added another two years. And so Hawaii's window will have been six years long, which is really, really remarkable. Um, and the scandals that they've uncovered have been um, pretty stunning. So, um, this is a result of my not being able to do graphics. <laughs> Those are states. Now, you might not think so, but you're not looking carefully. But the information is legit if the graphics are not. So, I mean, I'm not even dyslexic. I mean, this is a problem. But anyway. Um, so, what you see is Arizona. Now, Arizona cracks me up because... Um, I was out at the Aspen Institute in um, June, and I went to a, a forum uh, where it was three attorneys general speaking. And uh, the three attorneys general are, are all about how, well, their states are going to save the world and the federal government's going to hell in a handbasket. And, uh, okay. So I raised my hand and I asked, I said, well, what are each of you doing about clergy sex abuse? What are each of you as attorneys general doing about investigating the Catholic Church? One was Oregon, one was Arizona, and one was Colorado. Arizona says, well, we took care of that problem a long time ago. 
I said, really? I said, I, I don't think the Tucson bankruptcy is really going to solve all your problems. Um, he said, oh, yeah, no, no, we solved it. And that was a Republican. And then in Oregon, Oregon AG said, oh, we solved it. I mean, we, we had the Portland bankruptcy. I mean, I was involved in the Portland bankruptcy. You did not solve your problems. But I just, I didn't say, I said, okay, thank you. And then the Colorado AG, to his credit, said, we are investigating very aggressively. And I'd already, I already knew what they were going to say. But, um, but my point is this. Afterwards, I went up to the Arizona guy and I said, you have a window opening. You might not want to publicly state again that you've solved the problem because there are going to be all these cases that are going to start rolling out and showing that you didn't solve the problem. So you might want to be a little more careful. And he said, well, could I talk to you if the cases start coming out? <laughs> Gave him my card anytime, anytime. Um, but so the <laughs> agreed. The the other side of the statute of limitations that is making it impossible for us to stop child sex abuse are the sex trafficking sides of it. So sex trafficking, which has now become more understandable to people through the Jeffrey Epstein scandal. Uh, and, and basically what sex trafficking is, is it's using a child for sex with something in exchange. It doesn't have to be money, but it can be. And the question is, is, well, how do we make the entities that are making that happen stop doing what they're doing? And again, the victims have very short statutes of limitations. But what you're seeing is the federal government has taken care of this to a large degree. So what this shows you is the criminal statute of limitations for child sex trafficking at the federal government level. On the bottom, we started in the 1980s and go to 2019. Anybody with the green is in the statute of limitations. They can press charges. It goes up in age from zero to 18. So you can see that there are a large number of victims that are going to be able to press charges against Jeffrey Epstein. That's why he's in federal court. The states stink. The states, unfortunately, on child sex trafficking, we do have the number on the left have eliminated their statute of limitations for the crime of sex trafficking, but the ones in the middle and over to the right have a, have a time limit. So there's a lot of work for us to do as we talk about child sex abuse statutes of limitations in the states. We should also be saying, and by the way, add sex trafficking to your SOL reform, because that will help change the system as well. So I just would like you to know who is on our team. That's me. Um, that's Alice Hannon. She is our statute of limitations staff attorney. She does nothing but statute of limitations. She is like a bulldog on these issues. Um, we will be starting a legal fellows program. We have two full-time lawyers who are joining as legal fellows next month. Catherine Robb, Catherine, would you please stand up? So what you may not know about federal tax law, which I didn't know, but if you're a 501c3 like we are uh, at Child USA, we're a think tank, we do research, um, I can only spend 20% of my time lobbying. And as you can imagine, I may spend more than that. Uh, but a 501c4 can lobby. And so Catherine, who is amazing and helped get the New York bill passed, uh, is now the executive director of our 501c4. And so Child USA is doing the legal and the social science research to back up the best policies to protect children. And Catherine is then taking that on the road to help the laws get passed. So she is your ally if you are working in any state and need support and assistance with uh, getting bills passed for the protection of children. We are about to launch a 50 state analysis of how the discovery rule operates in each of the states. 
it's, I know it sounds very technical, it is, that's why Alice is doing it. Um, but it's very important because there are a lot of states where victims have rights that they may not fully understand and I think sometimes the lawyers don't fully understand it with all due respect to the lawyers out there. Um, and we'll be issuing a, a, a new white paper uh, exactly on where we stand in each of the states soon um, for, uh, uh, to summarize it in English. Right. I mean, the whole reason I have a website and the whole reason we do this stuff is my theory is someday I will not have to talk to a reporter. Right. I would say, go to the website. That has not happened yet. Uh, apologies to the media in the room. <laughs> You're lazy. Um, anyway, so uh, I am 100% with Tim and with Zach on this is a human rights project. Children's rights are humans' rights, and we must protect them because they are radically vulnerable. Children can't protect themselves. 17-year-olds can't protect themselves. Six-year-olds can't protect themselves. And what this movement is trying to do is to empower them. And so I ask each of you to help us, to work with us, and to carry this message to the world because we're going to empower not just the United States, Chile just signed a law which eliminated the civil and the criminal statute of limitations going forward. <laughs> Spain has a pending bill. Australia, greatest study in the world, the Royal Commission, working on the legislation. Um, Japan is looking at it. Germany is looking at it. We're going to change the world, and you guys started it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have an opportunity for uh, questions. We don't have a microphone, so. If you have a question, hold up a card, and we'll try to call you in order, and Marcy is... Thank you. So, anyone have any questions, please? Yes, sir. Shake up. I'm wondering why uh, Catholic Church has not yet been uh, charged with the racketeering influence conspiracy organization. So, the, yeah, the... the Right, so there are two answers to that. One's political, one's statutory. So the, the federal RICO does not apply to child sex abuse. It's not a predicate act. And so it's not a good fit, sadly. We need to amend the federal RICO. The political answer is that the Department of Justice does not permit anybody to investigate a religious group unless you go through deep screening. They just avoid it. So what you're going to see coming out of Pennsylvania is charges against individual priests, which you will see. You will not see charges against bishops. writing it down. All right. All right, I'll give you the sorry. I got a good mouth. So going back to the federal when when priests and churches take children out of state, why can't the Mann Act be applied in that case? Uh, the Mann Act can, except the statute of limitations was short until relatively recently. And so for the vast majority of the abuse that would have happened before the 90s, the statute of limitations expired. For the abuse that's more recent, yes, that's an option. Um, but again, the FBI is terrified of the um, churches after Waco. 
Um, and I've been told directly by more than one FBI agent that the federal government is very concerned about looking like it's going after a religious group. And my answer is, stop it. But that's where they are. It's politics. It's politics. Marcy, as you yeah. know, we're hung up in Pennsylvania <laughs> yeah. on what seems to a lay person as an esoteric question about constitutionality. And I don't want you to necessarily answer just for Pennsylvania because we have lots of folks here, but what do we do as lay people in a certain sense to push back against these, these weeds that we get, uh, that we drift into either because of legislatures or uh, our own amateur tendencies? Okay. James, you're, yeah, yeah, so here's what's going on in Pennsylvania, my home state, of course. What's going on is that uh, the Catholic bishops and the insurance lobbyist Sam Marshall figured out a brilliant strategy in which they said, oh, sure, you can have a window so long as you get a constitutional amendment first. First of all, they're lying about it being unconstitutional. They are lying. It is constitutional, and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court would uphold it. But let's just set that aside for a minute. What's happening is they want to force the victims to having to start lobbying for three years for a constitutional amendment. You can only get a constitutional amendment if the identical version of the bill passes twice. You change a comma, you have to start over. It is a process that's intended to fail. So you have to get it perfectly passed twice in both houses. Then you get to have a public referendum in which the insurance industry and the bishops get to have commercials saying, you're going to bankrupt us. So what it's intended to do is make everybody wait three years. It's cruel. So here is my very short, just on the ground advice get Democrats elected in 2020. Now, having said that, there are three seats that are weak right now where Democrats have a shot in the state of Pennsylvania. So that's where the action is gonna be. I have another question here from uh, Paul Peterson. Could the SOL be told by charging churches with consumer fraud? Well, that, what West Virginia has done is brilliant. The attorney general there is the one who is going after the bishop. And the theory is consumer fraud because they keep saying they have the gold standard for child protection while we keep finding out about more and more abusers in our midst from them. And so that's actually lying to the public. You're telling parents we have the gold standard for child protection, come on in but we'll have a few uh, priests over here who have problems, but don't worry about them. So we need more West Virginia, West Virginia attorneys general, which is a line I never expected to say ever, um, but we do. Uh, this is gutsy, it's original, it's brilliant, and it's true. They've been lying about the safety of children in their own care. So one more question and then I have to take the train because I have to go on my family vacation tomorrow and if I miss it, I die. Mar so, Marcy, we wish you a good vacation. I'm over here on to your right. Oh. Um, thank you for your patience, your perseverance, and for letting us know um, what is really happening. I want to know if you observe, I know you talked about the law and, and the various aspects of that. In, I'm in Connecticut, so mm -hmm. I see us moving up in the chart. Thanks. Uh, there's still work to be done. Yeah. But what I see um, happening in the diocese level was a campaign, financial campaign, where the church uh, said, we need half the money that's coming in, but we're going to make uh, 501c3 corporations lay lead as a way, and I'm, the attorney friend of mine next to right. me, right to the bishop said, where's the lockbox? And he had to explain that concept to my attorney friend. So where else in the country are we seeing the stop writing the checks and things will happen? It certainly wasn't going to help the young children today. Right. But how is the church reacting in another way uh, that you see in other parts of the country? Because that's what you've gathered together, lots of facts. Right. So uh, 
the church remains, the, the bishops remain the primary upfront lobbyist against the windows and against the victims. Um, but they're not just fighting on SOL reform, they're also fighting on not, they don't want to be mandated reporters, and they also don't want to lose their confessional privilege, which keeps them from having to be a mandated reporter when they're a mandated reporter. So th there is a multi-level set of lobbying that's going on from the bishops and uh, with their friends, the Mormon bishops, with their friends, Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, they're they're all lobbying together to try to block the victims. But you know, the most powerful and moneyed entity that are that lobbies against the victims is not the church. They are your front person. It's the insurance industry. And so I have instituted a project. We are meeting with the insurance industry because they should be part of prevention, not just reactionary. So we are making good progress in persuading them to break away from the bishops. Uh, as I understand it, their annual meeting, which was very, very recent, there was a concession that statute of limitations reform is inevitable and they just don't want Vermont. Okay, I don't need Vermont now. I'll take, oh, I don't know, New Jersey now. And then we'll talk about Vermont later. So the insurance industry can do the following. For every youth serving organization, they can require as a prerequisite to coverage, a child protection audit, which is a state of the art, cutting edge set of rules about what you must do in your organization to protect children. If you don't pass that audit, you either cure by improving your procedures or you don't get insurance. And in the United States, if you don't get insurance, you go out of business. This is the, this is the civil society answer. So in addition to legal liability, which has now forced them to be unhappy with us and worried, we have this possibility of bringing in prevention in through the system. We only wear seatbelts because of the insurance industry. We can protect children if we can get them on the side of prevention rather than reaction. And I think we just about reached that point. So thank you so much.